The Covenant Podcast exists to discuss doctrine, theology, and the biblical worldview from a covenantal Baptist perspective. We pray that this resource will be edifying to you and glorifying to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let's get started. Welcome to the Covenant Podcast. Jimmy Johnson here with Austin McCormick, and we would like to welcome our guest, Dr. Tom Nettles, the Senior Professor of Church History from the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Nettles, and if you'd like to share anything else about yourself, you may. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm really looking forward to our time together. No, you've introduced me sufficiently, so we should get into our subject. All right. Well, the subject that we're going to be talking today is James Pettigrew Boyce. And so uh, we're grateful that you took the time to talk about this with us. So our first question is, who is James P. Boyce and why is he important? Well, James Pettigrew Boyce, uh, first of all, he's important for Baptist life because he was the founder of the first theological seminary among Southern Baptists. Uh, But he's important for other reasons also. He represents something of the way uh, life was like in the, in the South during the, the pre-Civil War days and then during the Civil War and post-Civil War. He represents sort of the transitions that many Baptists had to go through during those days. Uh, uh, he is one who shows the genuine piety that exists in people who probably had mistaken views of, of other issues that we may get into later, and yet... Uh, how we can still respect that real piety and theological strength in, in spite of looking at some of the, the issues that we may disagree with him on. Um, uh, he also shows, I think, something of the power of grace in a person whose life could have been very easy. He was from a family that had the most wealth of anyone in South Carolina, and yet he was captured by the grace of God and He wanted to make his life count and make his fortune count uh, for the propagation of the gospel. So those are some of the reasons that he's uh, important. Uh, He was a theologian. He wrote a very uh, fine, systematic theology uh, that helped Baptists for some decades in formulating their ideas of how to develop a coherent understanding of the Word of God. And he provided, therefore a standard to which we can look back to that will help us in our own age. The next question is, could you just provide us a brief biographical sketch on him and give us some of the background that you alluded to? Yeah, well, <clears throat> Boyce was born in, I uh, don't remember the, uh, shamefully I wrote a biography of him, I can't remember the exact date of his, mm-hmm. his birth, but anyway, he was, uh, born prior to the Civil War, he was from South Carolina. His father was a, a, a banker and an investor and a tradesman. Uh, there is a, a wharf in Charleston, South Carolina that's named after him, the Boyce Wharf, where the trading he did of cotton goods for goods that he brought in from outside of the country was there. And so he was a very privileged person uh, when he was born as a, in the uh, the 18. 18- 30s, around 1835, uh, probably. Uh, But he also uh, was reared within a situation where uh, one of the greatest preachers in Southern Baptist life at the time, Basil Manley Sr., was his pastor for the first 10 years. His mother was a Presbyterian, and she was converted to Baptist life after she heard Basil Manley Sr. preach a funeral message for his son, based on the text, if I am bereaved, I am bereaved, of submission to the sovereignty of God and the providence of God and the death of his son. And uh, She felt that, that there was a person who could handle that kind of tragedy in such a way that she wanted to hear him preach more. She began to attend. She was converted. She was, became a member of the church. And so he was reared then within that, the context of that, that church. Uh, he was given a good education because of the of economic status of his father after he finished all his preparatory work and which was some very uh, fine teachers and tutors that he had he went to brown university it was while he was in brown university his junior year that he was converted there was a revival on the campus uh, 
a man named Francis Wayland, who was another very important figure in 19th century Baptist life. He was a Northern Baptist uh, and was a tremendous educator, wrote several different books that were used in other colleges, like Elements of Moral Science and Elements of Political Philosophy and, and Elements of, of Intellectual History and those kinds of things. And so he had a very good president and who did tutoring at, at, for the seniors. He was converted his junior year during a revival, and he went back and he was, became a very powerful witness. And at that time, he drew the conclusion that he didn't want to give his life to anything except the propagation of the gospel. This disappointed his father because his father wanted him to be the heir and the uh, person who had handled his wealth and invested in the right ways and all those kinds of things. Uh, and so uh, he... Nevertheless, his father didn't disown him or, or get, lose confidence in him. He was simply disappointed that he was going into gospel uh, ministry. So he graduated from Brown University. After that, he became editor for uh, a, 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 a few months of a paper called The Southern Baptist, which was uh, produced from Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, he learned some of the pitfalls of being an editor because some of the things he said were challenged by people in the convention, especially some uh, the landmark movement, which was a, a major movement within Southern Baptist life that had to do with ecclesiology. But he had intended to go to theological seminary anyway, so he, re he resigned from that, that paper. He went to Princeton Theological Seminary. He did all the courses in two years, but he didn't graduate because graduation from Princeton was simply basically amounted to an approval of the candidate for Presbyterian ministry. So he didn't have any intention of going into Presbyterian ministry, so he didn't officially graduate, though he finished all those the courses. Uh, he came and he, he taught at Furman uh, University, uh, and his inaugural address at Furman University, after he had taught one year, they would have the inaugural address. His inaugural address was called Three Changes in Theological Institutions. And it was there that he set up his idea as to the kind of theological institution that Baptists in the South needed. Uh, there were three points he made. One, that it should provide a, a, a theological education for those who had only a common English education, who did, were not college graduates. Some of them perhaps had not even finished high school, but he knew that there ne needed to be an abundant ministry, so it had to provide courses for those. Second, it needed to provide graduate studies for others, because Baptists were studying in, in other schools, where they were studying in Germany. He had seen, even at his young age at that time, falling away from the faith, uh, changing theological positions. Uh, he didn't want that to happen, and so he thought that Southern Baptists should be uh, producing their own theological education. And the third change was that it had to be governed by a confession of faith. And he had an extended presentation of the value of a confession for an institution like that. And it, is, it still is a very powerful um, presentation of the need for maintaining faithfulness to a theological position by requiring uh, a, a signing of this confession and a teaching of it from the heart. Not, not just, I want to get a job, so I'm going to sign this, but a person who really believes it and is willing to, to teach in accord with it. So he produced that then, and he convinced a, a, a large number of Southern Baptists they needed to establish this school. So there were education societies that were founded in Southern Baptist life. Uh, they moved toward doing a, a theological seminary. It was approved in 1858, but some of the faculty members that they wanted to hire were not willing to leave where they were. One was John Broadus. He was pastor in Charlotte's Ville, Virginia, and the first time he was asked, he didn't go. So they brought us, continue, uh, boys continued to travel around the convention to gain support for this. They tried it the next year, and so in 1859, they were able to find the faculty, and they opened in Greenville, South Carolina. He was there in Greenville, South Carolina until 1877. Uh, boys went to Louisville after the Civil War. Uh, all the endowment was gone. They knew they needed to be at a place where they could support things. He went to Louisville in 1870, worked for the endowment, worked to get support. By 1877, the school moved to Louisville. It's been there ever since. It was downtown at uh, a downtown address, 5th and Broadway. 
in downtown Louisville, and then it moved out to a place uh, that was is on uh, Lexington Road, a place called The Beaches, uh, because of the large number of beech trees that are that are on the campus that are still there, uh, and. The seminary began to, to grow. It had a theological controversy, the famous toy controversy, in 1879. Uh, and Boyce had to gear the had to drive uh, had to uh, steer the seminary through that. He had wanted to travel all his life, but he gave his whole life to making sure the seminary was secure. And then the last months of his life, he took a trip uh, to England and then to France, and he died uh, in France. Uh, about 1888. Well, you mentioned uh, John Broadus whenever you uh, gave a biographical sketch of Boyce. Uh, what was Boyce's relationship like with John Broadus? He met Broadus on the train on a trip to the Southern Baptist Convention very early, one of the first two or three conventions that they held. And Boyce was sitting with a, a mature man who knew him and was his friend, and then he saw Broadus come on. Broadus was pastor at First Baptist, or, or the Baptist Church in Charlottesville. He said, I have a man I want you to meet. You'll get along uh, splendidly. So he introduced Boyce to Broadus. They visited during the convention. They became fast friends. And so when Boyce wanted to establish the school, uh, Broadus was the first person he asked. He said, the school won't succeed without you. Broadus didn't feel like he could leave his, uh, leave his church at that time, but the next year he did. But then they were the stalwarts of the, of the faculty. Broadus taught preaching. He taught New Testament. Uh, he was superb in both. He was recognized worldwide as a scholar, both in homiletics and in New Testament studies. Uh, and he became the president of the seminary after uh, Boyce died. He and Boyce were both Friends of Toy, C.H. Toy, tried to encourage Toy, steer him back toward his uh, position of biblical authority. Uh, their encouragement didn't overcome the propensity he had toward critical theories, and so anyway, Toy had to resign. But Boyce and Broadus both stood by him. They remained his friends. And actually, Boyce recommended him to his position at Harvard, recommended Toy to his position at Harvard, saying the theological positions that he held are things with which we disagree and he could not serve us here, but there will be no objection to the views he has at your school, and I can assure you he's a man of splendid character and is an exquisite scholar. Uh, and so Harvard hired him, and he taught there for the rest of his, uh, rest of his days. But Broadus was a very was a, a tremendously uh, astute scholar, uh, humble uh, Christian uh, and sort of the uh, representative Baptist. I think there is actually a, a figure of Boyce on Armitage History of the Baptist. The, very, the, the, the uh, cover has a picture of Broadus on it as sort of the, uh, the, the representative Baptist. At Covenant Podcast, we've talked about several Baptist history figures and, and believe church history is very important and we stand on the shoulders of those who go before us. And with that said, who were some of the major influences upon Boyce, both in his, his ministry career as an administrator and setting up the school, but also as a systematic theologian? Well, let me just mention a, two or three. Um, first of all, the, the, the first pivotal influence on Boyce was his pastor, Basil Manley Sr. Basil Manley Sr. was the father of Basil Manley Jr., who was also one of the first four faculty members. Uh, and uh, he was a very powerful preacher. He was an Edwardsian preacher. Uh, he, had read, he read Jonathan Edwards. He understood the thought of Edwards. He didn't buy into some of the New England theology that had developed after Edwards. And so he was a historic confessional Calvinist of an Edwardsian flavor and and Boyce heard him preach and knew this. Uh, then he was influenced uh, by Francis Wayland, as I mentioned. Francis Wayland's uh, theory of education was something that was very important, and he sought to implement that the method of study, the, 
uh, the, the lecture method plus the sort of a question and answer method of classroom discussion was implemented by Boyce under the influence of Francis Wayland. He was influenced by Princeton theologians. His favorite uh, teacher there was Charles Hodge. And so Hodge, you, he quotes Hodge regularly throughout his abstract of systematic theology. And the confessional position that he took, he found that the confessional position that the, that the Princetonians took was similar to the confessional position that Baptists had taken. So he was very influenced by that, and that, that informed him. And He read some of the Presbyterian defenses of creeds before he wrote his three changes in theological institutions. But his argument, of course, was that this is Baptist, so he was influenced by reading the Presbyterians. He saw something of the Baptist genius in that also. He was influenced by uh, Francois Turretin, uh, who was a French uh, theologian, a Calvinist theologian, uh, and what is called an elinctic theology, which means he does theology by taking the categories and then he'll set forth, like, the, there's a Roman Catholic view, here is the Lutheran view, here is the Arminian view, here is another view, and then I, he asks questions about all this. Why is this view wrong? Why is this view wrong? Why is this view wrong? Then he sets forth his own view. So it's, it's called uh, Turretin's Elinctic Theology. He taught that in an advanced course regularly at Southern Seminary. Uh, and then he was also uh, influenced by the whole issue, the whole uh, corpus of a uh, Protestant scholasticism. He taught a course called Latin Theology because all these Lutherans and Calvinists, they, they wrote in Latin to communicate with each other. And so his Latin Theology also engaged people like, like uh, uh, Tertullian and, and Cyprian. So he would do patristic theology in Latin, then he would do Reformation uh, Orthodox theology in, in Latin. So those are some of the main uh, theological influences uh, plus the Charleston Association, in, of which his church, First Baptist Church Charleston, was a part, was a very strong confessional church. It was the head church of the Charleston Association, which had adopted the Second London Confession as its confession of faith. So that, that, that's sort of the, uh, the framework of his theological development. You mentioned in your biography sketch on Boyce, uh, his desire to start a seminary and him doing that. Uh, can you flesh out a little bit more why he desired to start the Southern Baptist Seminary? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, he valued theological education. He knew that there, were, there was a, a suffering of the churches because people did not have theological education. They had two or three themes that they could preach on, and they would preach on very well. But he noticed that preachers would take a text, and no matter where they started in the text, eventually they'd get back to one of the two or three themes that they were very familiar with, with the same exhortations, the same illustrations, and every sermon would sort of fall back into the same pattern. And he felt that this was not good for the preachers, it was not good for the churches, that, there was the, that the Bible needed to be dealt with on its own terms, that there were many more things that needed to be uh, set within the whole context of a Christocentric understanding of Scripture uh, that could help. And so it was just his observation of what the uh, theological condition was like in the churches the second thing was those who did get advanced theological education uh, would go to schools in the north. Now, there was a, a bias <clears throat> that he had against abolitionism, and some of the schools in the north were teaching abolitionism. He didn't want preachers go, who, from the south going up there and either quitting because of that or imbibing those, those positions. So that was one thing that he was against. The second was that they, there was a, a movement toward liberalism already in the middle of the 19th century. They were adopting higher critical theories. He could see it. He was very astute and observant theologically. And so he wanted a school that would critique those views but would not begin to embrace them and teach in accordance with them. Also, people that would go to non-Baptist uh, theological institutions, like he did at Princeton, would be faced with the arguments for non-Baptist theology, particular paedo-baptism, and he had seen some Baptists lost to the, of the Presbyterians as a result of that. Also, if they went to a European school, that was the hotbed of where all the critical theory and the search for the historical Jesus and all of this was going on at that time, and 
uh, Schleiermacherian theology and so forth. And so uh, he did not want <clears throat> uh, Baptists having to endure that. He said either that if they came back solid, it would be at the expense of three years where they could have been edified rather than fighting. Or if they didn't fight and embraced it, it would make them useless for Baptist ministry. And so those are some of the factors that said we've got to have our own theological institute. It can't be something that is uh, second rate. We have to have good scholars there. We have to be able to be aware of all the spectrum of theological education, but we have to know where we stand confessionally within uh, the Baptist framework. And so that's the, that's the reason he wanted to start Southern Seminary. You've mentioned in our, our time together, and you, you write about it at length in your biography on Boyce, about one of his major pillars in starting a theological institution is that it had to be confessional, as well as being one who studied Latin theology would have been familiar with the creeds also. So what, what was Boyce's thought when it came to both creeds and confessions? Are, are they important? Are they useful? And things of that nature. Yeah, from the, just observing what he said is three changes in theological institutions, that it has to be an institution that's based upon a confessional subscription. And then the particular defense that he gave of that shows the importance that he had. He believed, first of all, practically it was important that if you're going to be a Christian institution, there are s some Christian doctrines that go to, de that are, that have been biblically, developed from a historical standpoint through the controversies that are, that are well settled. And everyone has to be familiar with those. Uh, in order to be a Christian, you have to believe them, like the deity of Christ, the doctrine of the Trinity. To be an evangelical, you have to believe in substitutionary atonement, justification by faith. These have been set forth in other creeds and formulas. And so just from the standpoint of familiarity, uh, from a practical standpoint of what the Christian faith is and commit yourself uh, to teach it, there should be a confession that guides it. Second, if there are those who objected to it on the grounds that they said Baptists have never been creedal, that they have no creed but the Bible, he says, well, that, that is true that we have no final authority but the Bible. That is our sole authority. That's our only authority. But we believe the Bible is clear and that you can express Bible truths in uh, well-digested language and clear language that affirms the uh, the, a, a solid uh, uh, kind of condensation of biblical truth that people should affirm and that Baptists have believed that and Baptists have practiced that. So it's not true that Baptists have, uh, that, that the, uh, the adoption of a confession of faith is the denial of the doctrine of sola scriptura. Baptists have held, held a sola scriptura. There's no authority but scripture. But they've also seen that confessions of faith can help define very central biblical truths in a clear way, and that should be done. And so he, <clears throat> then he argued that some people have mistaken our views of liberty of conscience for a lack of conviction about truth, that we have liberty of conscience because we're uncertain of the truth. And he would argue, no, we have liberty of conscience because we're certain of the truth. And one of the truths we're certain of is that the church can only be found, uh, formed by the truth itself and by the work of the Holy Spirit and when the government becomes involved and seeks to uh, force people into a religious persuasion, you automatically pervert that religion, and especially you pervert uh, the church. Uh, and so liberty of conscience is not an agnosticism at all. It's not an uncertainty about truth. Uh, it is an absolute certainty about what the church is, what the church should believe, and a commitment to the sovereignty of God in producing the church. Uh, but for the church itself... We must affirm those truths that will forever uh, profess uh, our convictions about what the, the Christian faith is. So he felt very deeply about that. He did not think it was a violation of any Baptist principles. Uh, and <clears throat> he believed that if a person was teaching at the seminary and they signed the confession of faith, uh, there should be no reservations, no mental reservations. There should no, be no private arrangements that a person is free to sort of... A, uh, reject one doctrine and accept another. He says it would be better for the whole endowment to be overthrown than that the principle be introduced that a person is free in any sense to uh, reject a doctrine of, one of, of a confession that he has signed. Mm -hmm. So he felt it was very important. And his convictions about that is one of the things that 
really uh, allowed Southern Seminary to be recovered from its its fall basically into a neo-orthodox slash liberal mindset for 20 or 30 years uh, during the 40s and 50s and 60s. Following up on that, can you tell us a little bit about uh, his abstract of systematic theology and uh, what does this work teach us about uh, Boyce as a theologian? Well, the abstract of systematic theology was finally written uh, came out, I think, in 1887, and uh, he died in 1888. So it was, it was published, it was in print before he died. He carried a copy of it with him, and he gave a copy of it to Spurgeon. Uh, he met Spurgeon on his, this final trip. Spurgeon and, and Boyce both had gout, uh, and they talked about their gout after the sermon at the Metropolitan Tabernacle. <laughs> uh, but Boyce was, was sick and he could not stay, he couldn't accept an invitation that Spurgeon had given him to, act, to, pre, to teach at his pastor's college uh, that next week. But he had been able to see his abstract of systematic theology come into print. It was a collection of lectures that he had been uh, giving. Uh, he used, very early, he used Dagg's Manual of Theology as the textbook during the days that when they were in Greenville, South Carolina. Uh, he would have them do readings also from Hodge. As I mentioned, he did his, his Latin theology. He had them read Turretin, uh, among, among others. Uh, and through the years, then, he was just collecting and making his own lectures. So he was more and more using his own lectures and, and having his lectures uh, printed until finally he was encouraged by others to publish this as a systematic theology. So he did some very hard work on it for about a, a year and a half, trying to get it all arranged in a coherent way and expanding his arguments in some place, interacting with, with theologians that he thought were good theologians but might have had certain points that he wanted to disagree with. And so it was, it was produced to be the text then that he would use uh, when he would come back to teach systematic theology. I don't think, I don't think he ever got to use the published book as a, as a text but it was produced just over many semesters of teaching and his continued interaction with the theolo theological ideas that were being set forth. And it represents what, how he thought systematic theology should be taught in a Southern Baptist uh, seminary. Uh, and so it was along the lines of the, the classical doctrines, the way confessions of faith are organized, the doctrine of God, the doctrine of Scripture, or sometimes the doctrine of Scripture, the doctrine of God, uh, the attributes of, of God, the creation, providence, the, uh, the fall of man, the covenant of redemption. He was a covenant theologian and so forth. Uh, he didn't have separate chapters on the, on the church, on ecclesiology, because that was taught in a, in a separate course. And so he didn't include ecclesiological uh, doctrines within his abstract of systematic theology. If someone were to look up Boyce or if they were to pick up your biography on him, they would find out eventually that, as you alluded to earlier, that he was against abolition, that he himself had slaves that I believe he inherited mm -hmm. from, from his father's estate, um, as well as he served as a chaplain for the Confederacy. Mm -hmm. With all that, what, how can we process through these things? Because it can be a very hot-button issue, especially in our culture, current American time. So how should we think about these things? Yeah. <laughs> very easy I question. no idea. <laughs> <laughs> That's difficult. How do you think about things like that? One, one thing is... Uh, if he had been advocating murder, we can say, oh no, there's a law of God against murder. The Ten Commandments say, thou shalt not kill. If he had advocated adultery and says a man who is an adulterer, nevertheless, if he has talent, he can be a good, a good pastor. He can preach well, even though he's an adulterer. We'd, we'd recognize immediately this is absolutely wrong. Uh, his own contemporaries would have booed him out of, out of town. Uh, if it were something like that, that was a clear cut moral issue, uh, he would obviously have uh, been against it and he would have been criticized even in the South for it. 
the issue of the relationship of slaves to masters, the issue of slavery in the South, as many people have pointed out, is not exactly the kind of slavery that you have in the, either in Israel or in the New Testament. Some of the studies we've had in the 20th century about this have made it clear, but it wasn't as clear uh, in the middle of the 19th century. So what the people in the South were dealing with was on a large spectrum. Some were clear um, advocates of the idea that people from Africa were sort of like a different race. They were, they were subhuman. And you have writings that, that talk about that. And it's, it's very frightening and alarming that people could come to those kinds of conclusions. And it, it shows up in the way that, that slaves were treated. Sometimes, I mean, Char uh, Wesley talked about his seeing a, a man buy a young a black man as sort of a toy for his child so he could whip someone that he wanted to whip and so forth, and just, just like that, just terrible stuff. E.T. Winkler, who was asked to be on the first faculty at Southern Seminary, but he, he couldn't, he, he didn't do it. He recognized those stories, and he said, those stories are probably true. That is probably the way many people in the South were. We made lots of mistakes and so forth. But then he, he has articles in which he tries to explain what the situation is, and he gives sort of a contextual explanation. Uh, Boyce <coughs> looked at the situation he had, in which he had over 20 slaves that he had inherited, he had properties he had to keep up in order to house them and provide for them. And they were the ones who, working, would create the wealth by which he could live and his family could live and he could continue to provide for them. So economically and the, the dependence that slaves had on their masters created a, a difficulty, created a problem. However, Boyce was not one of those who said, well, slavery is a curse on us. We need to get rid of it. We, we would if we could do it immediately without inflicting greater harm on the society and on them. So immediate emancipation was not something that anyone thought was actually going to work, to be helpful. <clears throat> Boyce, though, however, called himself an ultra-pro-slavery man. So, so he didn't have any kind of uh, resistance to the idea that slavery was a concession, a societal concession that had been made in a fallen world for different levels of development to get along with each other. So there was a sense in which he believed developmentally from a cultural standpoint, the African race was not able to cope with a white society. And so it's better for them to be enslaved and be told what to do and so forth. So all that has to be put out there. We have to recognize that's true. And, and he believed that those were legitimate arguments. Also, <clears throat> if you look at the slave-master relationship in the New Testament, unlike murder or adultery or, or, or thievery, except when it comes to man-stealing, this, this was sort of the chink in, in that where Paul mentions man-stealing as one of the violations of the law there in 1 Timothy. Uh, the slave-master relationship is governed as a concession to the way different levels of society can get together and, and benefit each other. And masters are even, slaves are told to, to view their masters as brothers and as beloved. So they would look at that and say, slavery is not condemned. Who are these abolitionists that say that this is intrinsically an evil? Uh, and so they resisted that simply because of these kinds of uh, instructions that were given several places in the, in the New Testament. They believed the abolitionists were going beyond the actual exposition of Scripture. Now, it's hard for us to put ourselves back in that situation to see how all of these things can be so convincing that we would call ourselves ultra-pro-slavery. But virtually everyone in the South was, was that way from just a, a very small spectrum, get, getting rid of those who think they're subhuman. The idea that they were, they were ontological racists is simply is, is not right. 
Uh, they believe that we all come from Adam. They believe that we all are fallen. They believe that we all are saved in the same way. The way Broadus talked about it was, he believed that there was a degrading impact from pagan religions that had happened uh, when Africans were in, were in Africa before they were captured and brought over. And that that degrading influence carried over. They would talk about in the first part of some of the catechisms that they developed for the slaves, how immediately upon conversion, there was a completely new way of developing intellectually, a way of expressing themselves. And so there were many people who thought that if there, was, if there were massive conversions of slaves, and that you went through this about two generations, that they would be able to come into society as it was and, and, and cope. So there was a hope in that. But during the time in which uh, Boyce and Broadus lived, they did not yet see that sort of uh, massive change taking place, some substantial change taking place, but uh, not to the degree that they thought would actually benefit either the, uh, uh, the white society or uh, what would be a developing African-American uh, society. When, of course, when the issue was pressed, the Emancipation Proclamation, the loss of the Civil War, the slaves were freed, uh, Boyce took it all in stride. He accepted it as the providence of God, and he tried to provide for all of his slaves. He, had, he tried to provide ways in which they could make uh, their living. There was, there was one... I know all this seems so weird to people who are listening probably because we're talking about, <laughs> about a 19th century pre-Civil War situation and it's, it's hard for us to get our minds around it, but one of his slaves, one of his female slaves, had fallen in love with a male slave that was owned by someone else. The male slave had a, had a, had a particularly um, advantageous uh, skill with woodworking uh, and all kinds of carpentry. Boyce didn't need that. He had others. But he wanted his female slave to be able to marry this man that she loved. She didn't, he didn't want them to just be meeting up with each other in different places and all. So he bought the slave and let them marry. Uh, and then when the, they were freed, he gave to this man all of the tools that he had bought for him to do his, his woodwork. Uh, they moved to, uh, to Tennessee they set up a home. He had a, he, he had a private business of, of doing woodwork. He was able to support his family in that way. And when the Southern Baptist Convention was held, uh, I think it was in, in Memphis, uh, one year soon after the Civil War, uh, that former slave of his, the woman, contacted Boyce and Broadus and asked them to come to their home to eat with them. And they did. They came and they, they served them a, a meal and were able to see how they were living. Uh, and so there was a, uh, there are mixed signals that you can get. Uh, I don't think that we can say these were people that were just uh, mean-spirited and that they hated uh, African Americans or hated their slaves. Uh, they were perhaps misguided in some ways. Some ways they were simply trying to do the best that they could. Uh, uh, sometimes they had convictions that this was the best way uh, to do it. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, before we begin to just condemn them as being heretics, uh, we need to try to nuance our understanding. We need to try to be critical in our uh, evaluation of exactly what the entire culture was like at that time before we begin to make uh, personal judgments on any number of people who were within that culture. That doesn't justify it, that doesn't make the whole situation something that is not uh, regrettable, but at least it does help us, I think, get some understanding of how people in the 1850s uh, might have responded to the sorts of particular conscientious sensitivities we have about that. I'll try to ask you a little bit easier of a question than Brother Jimmy just did. <laughs> Am I going too long? Am I just going This is our last question we have for okay. you. So uh, our last question is, what can we learn from uh, Boyce, from uh, us as pastors and just as the laity altogether? What can we learn from the life of James Pettigrew Boyce? 
Well, we could put it at the level of, of just his professional life as a minister and as a, a theological teacher, that his instincts about theology were, were tremendously helpful. Uh, there were se several fact sometimes faculty members, the other faculty would want, it, want to get a faculty member and he would read them and say, no, I don't think we want him. He's not going to be, he's not going to remain stable. And he would be right about it. We would see something that would happen to them later. And, and so the uh, we, we owe him the idea that he was very careful about the direction of the school theologically. He didn't want to be flippant or just casual about who he got. He wanted to make sure that they had evidence that they were long-term going to uh, be uh, safe and, and uh, edifying teachers. Uh, we can learn that it's a good thing to be uh, understanding with people that seem to be veering off to try to bring them back, as he did with C.H. Toy. But then you reach a point where you realize that they're just not going to change, that they're conscientiously committed to the position that is distinct from the confessional position, and you have to make a way for them to, to go out uh, gracefully. Uh, I think we can learn from him in that way. I think we can learn from him also that the purpose of theological education is not to produce, in the main part, uh, scholars, other than as the so scholars can aid the church in teaching other, other ministers, but the main purpose of it is to produce uh, competent ministers. He was aware that the seminary could not call people, the seminary could not give them spiritual gifts, the seminary is not the Holy Spirit, but the seminary could provide means by which uh, natural gifts, both uh, spiritual gifts and intellectual gifts, could be trained so that they could be more effective ministers, so they could understand the Bible better, so that they could communicate and speak uh, with uh, greater clarity. And so that, that whole spectrum of, of, of what is theological education, I think he has a lot to tell us. Uh, I think he has something to tell us about stewardship of life. Uh, he was always working toward what steps he could take to make himself and others more effective. Uh, this is the reason that after he was converted, he studied hard his senior year, but he also took advantage of every opportunity he could to set up uh, meetings and to have personal conversations with people to talk about the gospel. He even committed himself to, he, to, to go as a missionary, but the Lord never uh, brought that to fruition, never called him to that. But he was constantly working toward things that would make him more effective for the gospel. Uh, this is the reason that after he graduated, he took that the position of being an editor he wanted to be able to, to set forth views. He called himself a watchman on the walls. Uh, young guy, younger than y'all, uh, seeing himself as a watchman on the walls. And editorial work would, would, would express things about the necessity of personal piety, uh, the necessity of study for the minister, um, all different kinds of things he would deal with in his, his editorials. He even carried an eight-part series between two people who had differing views of justification by faith, one who did believe in imputed righteousness and one who did not. And so he carried both sides of that. He was clearly on the, on the side of the one that believed in imputed righteousness, but he wanted the whole readership to see what the arguments were. So, so he carried that series, and that's, that's in the process of trying to take advantage of the time, take, trying to take advantage of the position he has in order to inform people. He went to uh, Princeton Theological Seminary for the same reason, to prepare uh, himself for that. He took a position as teaching for that reason. Very soon after he began teaching, he began to think about theological education. So he's always developing one step uh, further as to how he can be of, of greatest use to the, to the church. And so I think that's a, a major life issue, is, is that we, we, we think uh, strategically about our stewardship of life, our stewardship of, of gifts. It's not that we ever want to be dissatisfied with where God has placed us now, but we always uh, want to be uh, in investigating as to how greater useful can result either where we are right now or preparing ourselves for other kinds of, of service. And so this sort of uh, stewardship of life, I think, is another thing. Uh, another, uh, a last thing I'll mention is his commitment to the providence of God, a very loving and submissive uh, kind of attitude toward God's providence uh, in his life. Uh, it took a lot longer to get the seminary to Louisville than he anticipated, but he just kept going year after year. Broadus went one summer to help him try to gain endowment. It was so hot, it 
burn their feet through their soles of their shoes. And the next summer, Broadus didn't go back. She said, I can't do it again. So, so Boyce was sort of on his own doing all of this, finding the place for the seminary, finding donors, uh, getting, go, speaking in the churches, getting them to, to sort of embrace the idea of having a theological seminary there, had, getting gout, being sick all the time, figuring out day by day if he could actually endure the pain in order to do what was uh, before him, uh, just this idea of, of, of a stewardship of life, but also a, a submission uh, to the providential situation that he found himself in. I think it's a, it's a good lesson in Christian discipleship. Mm. Well, Dr. Nettles, we're thankful for you to take all this time today to talk about James Pettigrew Boyce. Uh, I know it'll be a great help to us and uh, to our audience. So thank you again for joining the Covenant Podcast today. My pleasure. Thank you. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Covenant Baptist Theological Seminary. CBTS exists to provide ministerial training in the context of a confessional local church. They are, among other things, confessional, Baptist, affordable, and accessible. They are also now fully accredited by the Association of Reformed Theological Seminaries. You can learn more about them at their website, which is cbtseminary.com. Org. Again, that is cbtseminary.org. Thank you for listening to the Covenant Podcast. If you've enjoyed this resource or you simply like the Covenant Podcast, head on over to our iTunes page, subscribe, and leave us a review. We are also available via Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, YouTube, and Podbean. Thank you for listening to the Covenant Podcast. Grace and peace to you.